Okay, yeah, now it's two o'clock. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this important, important dialogue on community-based uh, learning. Um, I heard wonderful things about the sessions this morning, and I'm honored now to present our speakers for the afternoon session. Um, our first speaker is Professor Tatiana uh, Botero from uh, the um, Department of um, uh, what is it, languages and uh, literatures at Notre Dame. I'm sorry, I'm still new, so I'm getting used to this new name. And um, so she will be speaking about uh, immigration and the construction of memory, uh, a service learning course. And I just wanted you to make, I just wanted to make you aware of the fact that we'll ask questions soon after each presentation. So I'm going to leave the floor to Professor Botero. And thank you. Well, uh, welcome and thank you for coming. Um, so I am here um, to talk to you today about the benefits and practical considerations of having a CBL, community-based learning or service learning component in your class. And I know that this morning we've heard a lot about that. Um, and also how reflective learning is an essential part of making the experience more meaningful to tear down you know, like classroom walls and the insulated atmosphere that sometimes the classroom uh, can make. So, and I know that also we've talked about that as well, about reflective learning. So, so that way we can make the course material uh, real and connected uh, to the teaching. So my name is Tatiana Botero and I am an associate teaching professor um, professor of Spanish at the University of Notre Dame. Um, I have been teaching in total about 25 years, which is when I was writing that number, I was like, woo, 25 years, wow, that's a lot of the years. Um, at this university, I usually teach um, third, fourth, and fifth semester Spanish courses, and for about four years, I have been teaching the course um, Immigration and the Construction of Memory. It is a course that I created, uh, I won um, a Ganey grant to develop the course, and, um, and so I've been uh, teaching it, and um, this class does require a community-based learning component, so my students, in addition to the classwork, they, uh, they do a final uh, project, which is a book, it's a big component of the class, and I, I brought some samples here, and I know that later this afternoon when we meet at Getty's house, Rachel will have the, all the other books that my students have created. Every semester we work with four families, which means that, uh, so uh, we, we create four books. Uh, and, um, and a big component of the class is the student's reflection. So uh, my class works with El Campito, which is our community partner, which you will also meet Laura uh, Jensen, who's the director, and she will be uh, there later this afternoon. And this is a bilingual child care center that is in South Bend and the west side of South Bend, which is the, normally the Mexican neighborhood in our area. Uh, and she'll tell you a little bit about the, the center. Uh, so my students work with El Capito and their families, and um, part of what I'm going to talk to you today comes from a bigger research project that my colleagues Elena Manjonelora, which she'll speak after me, and Rachel Parroquin, we have been working on for, for some time. Um, so, so um, students worked with selected Latino families uh, and we, one of the criteria that I look for is several generations of Latino of, of, of the, in the, within the family to have several generations like the, uh, you know, the grandparents, the parents, the children. And um, so they work with Latino families to preserve and document their histories, creating a lasting record that they can proudly pass down to future generations. By being involved in this important project, students will not only enhance their language skills, but also their cultural awareness of and sensitivity to this growing demographic group, as well as further develop their civic engagement. Through literature, film, current event, and guest speakers, students will develop knowledge about migration issues, family immigration histories, and problems facing our Latino communities in general, and particularly here in South Bend. Students 
Um, through ethical engagement, we'll work on a collaborative creation and preservation of memory, memory of an experience that shapes our family's everyday life. Using storytelling techniques, students work with families to create and record family histories using a variety of methods that will work, result in a couple of different pieces of work. Recorded audio interviews using NPR's technique of StoryCorps, Every Voice Matters, and collaborative books detail, detailing their family's life and path that has led them to our community. The dispositions that the students will further develop through mutual collaboration with the families, formal writing and reflective, reflective assignments are the following. Understanding of the Latino culture and appreciation for their customs and aware, awareness of the diversity of Latino culture, intercultural competence as well as reflective sensibility that will encourage lifelong learning. So uh, importance and benefits, so let me tell you a little bit about what the research says. So Gregory Thompson in his book published on uh, November 2012, Intersection of Service Learning Research and Practice in the Second Language Classroom says, first benefit is transfer of learning. Uh, he said, and I quote, the goal through service learning then is to bring positive transfer that enables students to bring the knowledge from the classroom and apply it into the community through service, end quote. So positive transfer occurs when learning in one context improves performance in another context. That is, learning moves from the classroom and the books to a wide variety of authentic situations where the students practice the language. It is an outward transfer. The second benefit is a civic engagement. So students become caring community members who develop an understanding, to develop an understanding of the values and the needs of the community. This engagement with the community will, in most cases, help and motivate students to learn more. They want to be able to communicate and they find the value of speaking the language. As citizens, we have an obligation to help those in need in our community. So I want them to move more from the idea of those immigrants as to the idea of, oh no, that's mi familia. You know, I know their story. I know who they are. I know their struggles. I know why they're here. And, I've, and I have a personal and more compassionate connection with them. So that way, um, it kind of changes the students' perspectives. Um, I want them to know that, you know, when someone immigrates here, in many cases, this is their last resort. Um, the third benefit is authentic opportunity to interact and offer feedback in a community setting. So to quote Swain, he said, learners need to be pushed to make use of their resources. They need to have their linguistic ability stretch to the fullest. They need to reflect on their output and consider ways of modifying it to enhance comprehensibility, appropriateness, and accuracy, end quote. Uh, the third benefit is active self-monitoring through reflections to create empowered lifelong learners. And the last benefit is partner, community partner goals. And so my class helps El Campito fulfill their outreach goal of community building. So before the semester starts, I work closely with El Campito in selecting our families, like I said at the beginning, to make sure that we have three gener uh, at least three generations. <coughs> if I have families that have more branches, it's great. If I have grandparents and uncles and the parents and the children, it's great. Sometimes I've had great grandparents, which is really, really great. Uh, many times I have the husbands also come, so we have the mom and the dad kind of uh, separated, and, and that way we get everybody's perspective. So. Um, because it is a Spanish class, I need to make sure that the families know that it's really important that during that time, you know, we speak Spanish uh, to, the, to the students. And because um, sometimes we have second and third generation here, and sometimes they feel more comfortable in English. 
especially the children. So, but this class in particular, this semester, we've worked really hard, even with the children, because the families want the children to pra practice their Spanish. <laughs> so my students have said, well, and they said it at the beginning, well, at least I'll speak to you in Spanish and then you can answer to me in English. Mm -hmm. But then the students now are seeing the value of kind of being their teacher. And so then they're trying to really hard to also use their language, with the, which the families are really happy to do that because the families, the children just have the time to use the language in the home because obviously everything else in their life is in English school and everything else. The other thing is that I, um, starting like maybe two semesters ago or two years ago, I start, I send the students an email in December, so before class start, and actually I meet with them in December. Uh, and go over uh, the class and the criteria and, uh, and kind of uh, the class requirements and any that is not completely like committed to the class and usually drops right away. Uh, which is really, really great because one, there's also always a wait list so I always have like by the next day someone has taken that spot. But two, is that I don't have anybody shopping around in the first week of January because I really start on week one with our project because 16 weeks a semester seems like a really long time but it really is not a long time. So then I have to start on week one so I have to somehow get rid of the shopping around. So by meeting with them in December it's a really great way and then when the first day of class comes I already know all my students so which is also great <coughs> a great community uh, in the classroom. Um, so on week one we start with a dinner with all the families that they're invited uh, and uh, we have to, I, we talk a little bit more in depth about the project and we also have them sign waivers uh, that are required for the IRB that I have, the Institutional Review Board. Uh, all my students are city certified, which is um, a certification, a training and certification to be able to do research with um, human subjects. So that's also really, really important. Then we have about eight weeks of interviews and the student role is that of a facilitator to help construct and remember those family memories. Uh, we, they help um, the families kind of bridge that gap between the oral memory uh, and the written stories. Um, now because the, uh, it is a group project and it's worth about 25% of their final grade, so I have um, you know, I give them like a job uh, assignment and I give them also a distribution worksheet. That way they know how to distribute the work among the, the group, that, which is usually groups of four. Um, and then that way I know who's in charge of what, who's doing what. They have 20 pages that they have to do in the book, so, and everybody has to have a divided labor. Um, we also, I also do like, scaffolding work so basically you know we work on little chunks at a time uh, every week students have a topic that they're working that week with the families they create questions uh, to for their family meetings which is on Thursdays and um, and then with those questions you know like the first time I just kind of let them oh, I'll give them some samples but I also kind of let them create it and then I then we talked the next week how did that go well I really need a lot of more questions I said, yes, but you also need a lot of questions that are better because if you ask something like, well, is your school different? Was, was your school different than the, your children's school? Then the answer is yes, period. Yeah. So you need to ask more you know, open-ended, like how was it? Can you explain? Can you go in detail? How was, you know, which one was your favorite teacher? Why was that your favorite teacher? So things like that. So they also learn interviewing techniques, how to ask questions and things like that. Then every other week they have to submit written work that obviously I grade, I give them feedback, but that's also, that's also material that's gonna go into the book. We have about two in-class working days where uh, in groups they work uh, in, in the book in class. We use Shutterfly, so <coughs> we create the books in Shutterfly, they work on Shutterfly. Just this past Monday they submitted kind of like their mid-semester Book. So right now they have to have eight pages completely done in their book on Shutterfly. Everything has to be done, books, uh, I mean, photographs, everything, which, um, which are now, then I can go in and check and make sure that we have no mistakes, no missing accent marks and all that good stuff. Um, I also create a Google document per group and each student has to, their writing piece, they, I use multiple different colors, so each student has a color. 
So then I know in the Google Doc exactly how much has each student written and how much work each student has done for that project. So, um, and then, um, and then talking, oh, so for some of the things that, um, that I hear when, I, when, they're, when, when they're working with their students, or I mean with the families, is like, oh, abuelo, I didn't know you did that because they're hearing stories that they've never heard before. Or, mama, I didn't know you liked math in school. Uh, or, mama, uh, you didn't have a smartphone? How did you text? Yeah. You know? <laughs> so, so these are all really like fun anecdotes that I hear. Um, so, um, talking about reflection, and, and, and I quote, uh, intentional systematic reflection of the experience must take place in order to thoughtfully connect the service learning experience with the assigned curriculum. Reflection is what transforms experiences into learning. So we, um, so obviously we pair the community-based uh, learning, so the service that they're doing with, um, with the reflection. So, um, now that we've seen the benefits, and we need to really explore the critical piece that makes it deeply meaningful and useful in advancing that li linguistics and cultural uh, fluency. So I'm not, this, we all know what reflective writing is not, so I really just want to make sure that we touch on what is uh, reflective writing. So reflective writing encourages you to consider and comment on your learning experiences not on what you learned, but how you learned it. The process of self-reflection individualizes and validates each student's learning styles and interests and puts the, uh, the responsibility on them to develop strategies that work for them. So, um, you know, here's some of the, you know, what students do, they, they respond to experiences, they have opinions. They uh, find out new information, they, they have thoughts and feelings, they explore learning, they gain self-knowledge and achieve clarity, uh, they understand what they're learning and how they're learning it. So um, it is really a place to use and integrate new grammar and vocabulary in, a, in the cultural concept, so it's really important. So um, I want to end with uh, two, um, two things, one is, um, I don't want you to take my word for it, uh, so I want you, I'm going to quickly read, these are some of the reflections that the students wrote at the end of the semester, and so one student says, Professor Botero's class was an experience I will never forget. I signed up for the class expecting to get in some extra Spanish practice and work with Latino community in South Bend, but this class has provided with me with so much more. I was blessed to work with the grandparents of a lovely family living in South Bend, listening to their stories from the Dominican Republic to the United States, and learning from them was what truly matters in life, family, hard work, faith, and fun. Through this experience, I gained a stronger grasp of the Spanish language, made a new class of friends, and became a nieta to two of the kindest grandparents I know. My experience with this class was truly a blessing, and I could not be more grateful for the opportunity to have taken it. So that's a student's reflection. And then I also want to read to you one of the, of the grandchildren and how they uh, put their piece into the book. And this was kind of done in secret. The grandparent, the grandfather did not know that she was going to do this but the students kind of made this piece work. So it's it, and, and I'm sorry, it's in Spanish, so I apologize for those that don't, um, but it says, Querido abuelo, soy yo, tu tomatito. Solo quería decirte que te amo mucho. Siempre has sido una gran parte de mi vida. Me has guiado, me has enseñado, junto con mis padres me has criado. Me hacen falta los días cuando era niña en que me cuidabas, cuando estaba enferma. Me dejabas mirar muñequitos en tu cama. Me hacías sopa deliciosa y me tenías, me tenías en tus brazos y me cantabas los pollitos. Me hace falta ser tu cookie, tu chiquita. Quiero que te quedes conmigo para siempre. No puedo imaginar mi vida sin ti. Tienes un lugar especial en mi corazón, ahora y para siempre, abuelo. Te quiero mucho. Gracias por todo. So, and with that, I end, and I have just a few minutes for questions. Yes. 
so is it, um, do you uh, design your course around, is it a language course or is it a content course? Um, so it's a fifth semester um, Spanish class. So it, and so our fifth semesters are more like conversations, advanced intermediate. So they're conversation classes. Uh, there's no actual grammar taught in the class. They've already seen. Um, we finished grammar at the fourth semester, so. And so is this, are they taking it because they're um, Spanish majors or is, could this fulfill a requirement? It does start fulfilling the, uh, a requirement for if they want to do a Spanish major or supplementary major. Um, they're allowed to take, this is a 20,000 level course, so they're allowed to take two 20,000 level courses. This, is, this could be one. Yes? I you mentioned a grant, right? Yes. To, um, I mean, to print the books, you need some amount of money to do that, right? Is it part of a grant money that you need to use to print? So, um, so we have, uh, we're, very great, we're very fortunate that we have, um, through uh, the, our department, the Department of Romance, Languages, and Literature, and through the, uh, through the Center for Social Concerns, uh, the, a big emphasis on community-based learning. So the printing of the books is part of uh, a budget allotment uh, from our department. Um, I don't, Rachel is the one that knows better because she's the one that handles them. <laughs> so, so Tatiana got help to cover the cost of printing the books the first year. Um, because my position is a joint appointment between Romance Languages and the CSC, there's budget that has been allotted um, at the CSC, but actually because we've been able to show, thanks to the great support of the CSC and our department chair who's in the back and other folks in the, in the department, we've been able to show success. So at this point, the dean of our college of our donors has, has started um, contributing funding and so we've been able to shift some of the funding from the CSC to the arts and letters to put that out of department to help create funds for other departments to be able to help this kind of initiative. So the, the meal at the beginning of the semester that the families are invited to and that's where Tatiana takes care of explaining all of the IOD protocols and doing all the behaviors of that. Um, that was funded through um, money from our department. The same thing at the end of the semester um, Tatiana's class, and you'll hear from Andrew's class tomorrow, there's an end of the semester celebration and books are, are given, the, the cost of the meals, the cost of the computer books, those are funded at this point through the dean's um, generosity. So, but yes, it, having the institutional support has been really, really critical. Yes, I just would like to know what is the process of choosing, choosing the families. Mm -hmm. Right, so, so the first semester was much harder to ch to find the families because they didn't know about the project. So I had to really, and it, it was all uh, obviously all in theory. So now at the cell is really easy because El Campito has a set of books that they they that they have. So then uh, you know Marisa and Laura you know show the books and uh, basically I have I have a wait list of families. So. Uh, which is also really good because it happens more, it's happened more than once where a family will say yes, and kind of come to like the first meeting and then decide no. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it's really easy because I have a, a, a list of uh, someone else that easily can fit in uh, into, the, into the thing. I had, a, I had one semester because you know, this is obviously it's, it's the, the families have to commit to 10 weeks of every Thursday meeting for an hour and a half. So I remember it was the first year or the second year, the, one of the families, she was pregnant and she thought she could do it, she really wanted to do it. But like middle, not middle, like maybe a third of the way she said no and I just at that point didn't know. Uh, it was really hard to in, in, involve a new family so I ended up, I had a family that had two grandparents and the grandfather was kind of controlling a lot of what a, a lot of what was happening so it was really great because I divided that into one grandparent and a granddaughter and the grandmother and another granddaughter so it was phenomenal because it gave the voice to the grandmother that uh, wasn't very uh, she was kind of a little bit voiceless so that was really phenomenal the way that worked out. Um, 
explain to them and to the families first what this project is about or is somebody there to explain to them? No, I do. I do. I go and I show them the books and I tell them what it is. <clears throat> it's to tell their stories and whatever stories they want to tell. You know, we don't push exactly like this kind of stories. We want just the family stories, like talking about like your childhood and how it was and where were you and what was important when you were little and what dreams did you have and what do you know about your mom and your grandparents that you want to pass down to your children? So that kind of information. Yes. And who are the authors of these books? Like who buys them? Do you sell them? Or no, we do don't sell them. them just yeah. for the record and did you think of using like instead ebooks rather than printing because printing is pretty much expensive? Yeah, so we want them to have the printed copy. Okay. So we so want the families to have a physical copy that they can actually sit down during family meetings and see it. Uh, because of many families might not have a computer, might not have an internet, so, um, so we want to make sure that they have. And no, we don't sell them, they're just for the families, we keep a copy. Um, at the CSC, we keep a copy here also at Latino Studies um, in their library, uh, and uh, we keep a copy. I keep a copy. And so, yeah. Thank you. Are students furnishing their own cameras for this, or do you have equipment um, that help you? So we're fortunate that we have a, a department, an OIT uh, office that the students can take out uh, audio recorders, which is what they use for every mm -hmm. every um, meeting. Uh, and, and then the students, uh, I get a OIT does a little brief training for them at the beginning of the semester, teaching them how to use it and then how to transfer those audio recorders. This semester we're doing e-portfolios as our final assessment, so they're going to they're putting all their audio recordings in the e-portfolio, so that way we have um, so that way we have them all um, available, and uh, and they can also check out cameras, but they usually use their phones and yeah. So and I think one last question because I think that they're. Maybe I missed it. You said that they sign waivers. So is that is part of that? Who owns the information afterwards? So I I have an IRB for the class. So so then I uh, so basically I mean I I have the, I have the information. So you could publish a book maybe. One I can. Like yes. Yes. Like yes. Yes. And that and that's the reason why I did the IRB. The IRBs yeah. are not easy to do. They're very complicated and lengthy, and you have to go through a lot of uh, explanation, and uh, and you have to basically show the IRB people everything beforehand, all your waivers, all your class projects, all your material, and so it wasn't easy, but I wanted to do it because I wanted to have the possibility of, if I want to like present on them, show them at present at conferences, and um, and you can't do the IRB retroactive, so. So, and then the students, part of the IRB is that the students have to do the city training, which if any of you have ever done the city training, is very lengthy. It takes about six hours, and the students do that over Christmas break because the first week of class they have to submit the, I, the their city training. But which is great for them because I say, you know, that's something that you can put in your CV, your resume, that you have city training. So. And I will be, I, I do have to leave in a little bit, but I'll be back at the CSC if, um, if anybody wants, has any more questions, but think. Can I just make a public service announcement? Yes. <laughs> the federal government is changing the IRB rules for non-medical human subjects work, so if you're feeling really intimidated right now by all that, it's supposed to get much easier starting this July. Oh, nice, nice. <laughs> nice. Okay. Nice. And so with that news, I guess we'll end, you know, our first interesting presentation.